Hello, welcome to the Classical Top 5. I'm Tommy Pearson and with me as always are Fiona Maddox, Chief Music Critic at The Observer and Richard Bratby, Critic at The Spectator. After last week's grand trawl through the operas of the 20th century, we scale it down a bit this week and consider concertos, wind concertos to be precise, although I haven't actually been that precise because when putting this subject to the panel I didn't actually say whether wind included brass or not, so it'll be interesting to see what everyone's come up with. Helping us here is our very special guest, one of the world's finest wind soloists and chamber musicians, who first came to prominence all the way back in 1980 when he won the BBC Young Musician of the Year. Since then, he's been a great commissioner and performer of works written especially for him by the likes of Harrison Birtwistle, James Macmillan, John Taverner, Michael Tippett. He's a founder member of Britain's Symphonia and the Hafner Wind Ensemble and a tireless supporter and campaigner on music education and much else besides its oboist, Nicholas Daniel. Nick. How wonderful to see you. Thank hey, everybody. You so it's great here. to see you. Thank you for having me. It's an honour. Well, um, and everybody always uh, says how much they, they enjoy being on this. On the other hand, also then saying what an absolute nightmare it's been yeah. trying to choose. I've had a, I've had a terrible few days. It's just been hell. I mean, I, I am still in the deepest trauma. And <laughs> well, uh, I mean, so it... <laughs> did you set yourself a criteria then for this one? Well, your criteria was good, which was choose things you love. I got a, a vague shortlist of about 30. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. And, and then I, I thought, well, cut it back to the bone. In the end, I just thought about each of the instruments that were unmissable and, um, and then went for the best pieces and then just see it, looked and thought how I felt about them, really. Mm. It's been really, really interesting listening to some, some things that I'd heard but not listened deeply to for a long time. It's wonderful, actually. And... In a way, a wind concerto is the closest you get to a voice concerto because the register is in approximately the same area. Um, there are more balance problems because a voice has got this extra kind of using literally the whole body as a, as a resonating chamber, which means that the great voices can ride a whole orchestra. So it's interesting thinking about the way that composers have dealt with that with different instruments and looking at how that's been done, remembering some of the pieces written for me as well and thinking how well the composers did it. You've reminded me of the great PDQ Bach, uh, who often wrote uh, those concertos for instruments. Peter Schickley would always introduce them as saying that these are instruments that the composer uh, needs to really think very carefully about the orchestration so that it's heard. And these are challenges that PDQ Bach never met in his lifetime. <laughs> I always think about that with, uh, with wind concertos. Okay, well, let's dive straight in, shall we? Uh, Nick, what's your first choice? Well, my first choice is the Finzi Clarinet Concerto. And it's partly, I realised, because of being deeply, deeply in love with one particular recording of it that I was obsessed with for years, which is Thea King's recording. Um, and, and Thea was a really good friend of ours for a long time. And, and I worked with her and knew her well. And she was a terrific fund of information and knowledge. But there's just something about that. Finzi slow movement particularly which is just one of the great pieces of, of, of writing it's it's got this thing where there's a lot of melismatic information which is which never feels like filling it's 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 a bit like the Beethoven violin concerto in a way it's just scales and arpeggios the first movement but what scales and arpeggios um, and with the Finzi it's interesting because that that recording actually was the beginning of a whole new renaissance of interest in British, uh, in British music, particularly in America. And that recording uh, issued by Hyperion was, was at the top of the American charts for more than a year, I believe, for a very, very long time. And it was the foundation, I mean, Ted Perry always used to say it was the foundation of the company. Um, and it's just, I think it really is a, a very special piece. Finzi himself said to Thea, and she told me this because there's a wonderful oboe and strings piece by him too, that he consciously poured and, and exorcised his pain into the music he wrote. And it's almost as though, a bit like the red violin, there's blood in it. Hmm. Um, there's, 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 I keep thinking of German words, but there's like knot and, and pain and, and suffering, which is always found a way to understand a bit like with some of those great howls pieces um but it's it, it, it for me it's one of those one of those works that has a very special place in my heart and, and always will do richard finzi i would imagine he's quite high up in your list somewhere isn't he? well, interesting he's, he's not a composer that 
I'd say particularly speaks to me, but I would make an exception for the clarinet concerto, which is, I'm delighted to hear Nick is choosing it. Um, like he says, I've heard that, you know, there's blood in the music and that connection to Herbert Howells. Um, again, that's um, a composer who's stereotyped as the English pastoralist. And in fact, there's a deep note of pain in their best music. And that's what I get with a clarinet concerto. This sort of, um, as you say, it's sort of gloriously lyrical, rich, melismatic writing, exactly perhaps what you would stereotype, you know, the idea of the English pastoral composer. There's this darkness beneath it, this intense um, brooding passion. Um, it, it takes you to some very, very deep places. And I mean, it's, it's one of those pieces that actually, you know, it, it, it makes me sit back and reappraise the composer every time I hear it. It's, it's not sort of what the easy image of Finn's ears. And, and, you know, it's intensely beautiful work, but you can't get past this with um, almost doom laden, sort of this very, I wouldn't say oppressive exactly, but this deeply overcast, tragic sense that underlies the music, which again, is not, does not fit the stereotype of 20th century English music of what, what you might call the pastoral school if you want to be. We're about to learn a lot more about Finzi because Diana McVeigh, who is his biographer, has just delivered to the publisher an enormous volume of letters which are about to be published. And I think that will give us an interesting insight into his written spoken voice, um, as, as well as knowing the music we know, which is, I, I'm looking forward to, she's an incredible person. She's in her mid nineties, still driving, goes out to Australia regularly to hear concerts. She really knows the inside of Finzi's work. It's gonna be a fascinating book. Do you think Finzi is a bit neglected overall, Nick? But amongst living composers so often, they're, they're dismissive of him because, um, but I think that that's, I think he, in a way what, what's happened is that people are realising there's more to him than, than the inevitable kind of stereotypes that people say about British composers. But the reality is that certainly for my instrument and to an extent the clarinet, there's a massive dearth, a massive lack of romantic repertoire because the piano and the violin to an extent, the cello and also a bit the clarinet kind of just took over in the romantic period. And, and we were inside the orchestra, yes, and we have some great chamber music, but it's not, it's it's in a way the the mid 20th century well early to mid 20th century british music is our romantic period and it's going to appear again in this discussion as, um, um, so i i sort of feel that that it's not always about um looking about exactly the contemporaneous pieces that were written around it it's about looking at it and saying is it good music and that for me is is always the question i i, I stick to the i stick to the Johnny Dankworth and Cleo Lane maxim about that is it good mm. that's the simple <laughs> yeah. do something to you yeah. he is neglected but I think singers love the songs we did just recently we did a piece called the fall of the leaf with Brit Safay with Mark Held which none of us had played before and we rehearsed it and it was it, we were doing it in kind of period style because we were doing Brahms symphonies too and that project is it, we're in the middle of that project as at the moment and hoping to finish it when we can get back on stage but what was interesting was seeing Mark in the first time we played the piece in the concert, we played it through because we didn't, we'd not played it quite through without stopping. In the concert, the Barbican, he stopped. <laughs> he, he put his hands over his face and we were just all, we were gone. You know, he was, he was in tears. We were in tears. Mm. Well, some of us were some of <laughs> less hard hearted ones were in tears, but it was, it was amazing, amazing experience. Short mm. piece, but wow, it packs a punch. Fiona, how did you get on with this subject of choosing your fire? Um, I, I was just delighted that we would have the incredible knowledge of Nick to um, introduce all of us, I imagine, but me particularly, to um, repertoire that I, I realise I don't know very well. And in some weeks, I've come along absolutely burdened by the number of choices. And this, this time, I found that... Whereas my instinct normally would be to go to the, the odd, the new, the, the little known. This time I've gone much more for things that are perhaps in the more um, mainstream repertoire because it's, it's, it, I, I'm not a, a, in any sense an expert in this field. I just know lots of the music and love it. But um, I, I had the Finzi clarinet concerto down as one of my um, sort of number six on my list, probably. If, yes. if we're going to make a list of five or six, bring in another one. I, I've gone back a bit in time. Um, I was pretty amazed to find that Vivaldi had written 
something like 39 bassoon concertos. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised if he wrote 230 violin. Why not write 39 for bassoon? Though I think two of them, feeble of him, weren't quite finished. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I really, I think this is a collective choice because I can't pretend that I know, I know them all. I know a few of them and I know one in A minor, which is a very um, robust and, and energetic piece in which the, the bassoon comes right in with a, a, f a fantastic energy and uh, um, it, 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 everything that you enjoy about Vivaldi and, and the reason that the Four Seasons is so popular is present in this music. And it does make you wish that people would experiment further than the, the, the limited, very well-known choice of the Four Seasons, because these are glorious works. And the bassoon, I, I don't know, maybe Nick will know what the bassoon was like in the early-ish 17th century when he was writing. Technically, it, it must have changed, but it's a very agile instrument in Vivaldi's hands, all those runs and arpeggios and um, ritonelli that's it, uh, that the orchestra has. It, it's, it's very uh, uplifting music. Yeah. I think it's a wonderful choice, and I, I agree. With the funny thing about the instrument then is that it had none of the mechanism, or almost none of the mechanism that it has now. So one of the things about the bassoon now is it's, it, it can be noisy unless it's really well maintained, so it has to be recorded really well. Whereas the Baroque bassoon is comparatively light as an instrument, so you don't, I mean, it's not got this huge weight like a tree almost. Um, and, and because of the lack of key work, your fingers are just able to fly. So it's, they're unbelievably virtuosic, many of the Vivaldi bassoon concertos, and the slow moves are great. I, th I think this, the fact that it's a body of work is good, I think, as well. So many great pieces. The, um, and it's the range of the instrument, actually, that the, is often the surprising thing, I think, for people, isn't it? I mean, the, obviously, the, there's the famous high uh, opening of Rite of Spring as, as, as a good example of a very high bit of tricky bit of bassoon but that's a good example of the the range the high and low notes of the instrument and what it can actually do given its general use in in orchestras i suppose yeah it's a it's a great choice i'm going to bring one in and i'm going to surprise everybody i've chosen mozart's clarinet concerto uh <laughs> which no one would have expected me to to uh to choose at all given almost everything i've chosen in this in this entire series has been in the 20th or 21st century. But I've chosen it because I, I, funnily enough, when I was going through all of this, I realized that I, when I picked five immediately out of nowhere, they were all clarinet or a saxophone, which I thought was quite interesting. And it wasn't until I started looking into, putting a little bit more effort in, and I remembered some other concertos that I really, really like, but it was the ones that were top of my head, I thought that was, was interesting. I don't really know why that would be the case. But the Mozart, I can do without Mozart most of the time. And uh, I know, I know. However, um, this is one of those pieces. Sorry, I just need to, where are my smelling salts? <laughs> I know, I apologize, I apologize. <laughs> We're all but fainting. One of the, oh, boy. I think one of the reasons, one of the possible reasons to this is because all, so much of my music education when I was younger was through performance. As a percussionist, you don't play much Mozart, so you don't get exposed to it as much. Um, and that's maybe one possible excuse. Uh, and I do love Amadeus, as everyone knows. But the clarinet concerto, I played it as I think almost every person who's ever played an instrument in the entire world has done, with Jack Brimer playing it. Um, I mean, he toured the world playing. This really was, I mean, he basically owned the piece, didn't he, Jack Brimer? Um, what a you wonderful You know what player. Jack used to say about his recordings of the Mozart? My first recording was where I achieved total perfection. The second recording of the Mozart is the one where I achieved utter sublime performance music. The third is where I combine all those together to make the ideal performance. <laughs> well, who can argue with that? <laughs> I loved him as a player. I loved him as a, as a, as a man. I loved him as a presence in an orchestra. Just I loved his wife. She was a complete scream with the pink well, hair. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think he was just one of them. And actually, just to play in a you know, provincial orchestra, but with someone like that, you know, of that, of that, great uh, you know fame and integrity and brilliance that was brilliant but um so that was one thing and, I, and i've always really liked that piece but the other uh, much many 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 years later i was filming with the city of london symphonia and michael collins was playing the piece and for, for whatever reason it just really got me i mean one of the reasons will have been mike 
Collins' his performance because he's such a phenomenal musician, beautiful player. But this is, a, this is one of those war horses, one of, these, one of those great works that everybody knows inside out and is played every five minutes. And yet every now and then it can just, it just does that thing that touches you. There's a reason it's the reason, there's a reason it's so famous, like all great pieces. I mean, it is, I, I was lucky enough to record it with Joy Farrell, my now ex-wife, a um, long time ago. She recorded a beautiful disc with the quintet and the Kegelstadt trio as well. And um, when you're inside the piece, it's, it's, its beauty is even more extreme. Um, and the thing is, it's, it is, it is a remarkable piece. Did you know that in, I think it's bar, it's in the last bit, bar 333, because it was written for a Masonic brother. There are three repetitions of the note A, which happened three times. And of course, the three is incredibly important in Mozart's Lodge, the triple um, motto, triple um, word motto. And the idea that he could somehow maybe put, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll write three A's in bar 333. I may have got some of these details wrong, but it's pretty much like that. And then actually write the rest of the piece around it. It's just like, how? <laughs> it's just impossible. It, I, it's totally on my list. I'm not going to tell you where. Yeah. Was, <laughs> yeah. Is, the, is the Mozart on anyone else's list? Oh, God. Yes, Richard. It was, it was, top, it was, it was top of my list. I mean, this is surely the greatest wind concerto of all time and i mean and i would say i with mozart alone i say at least i say three of his concertos made my my list in the first version and there are at least four mozart wind concertos that are still probably better than any other concertos that have ever been written for those instruments um which aren't even on the list i mean where does one start i mean all the things you say it's um the clarinet concerto i think it's his last completed instrumental work um he was working on the magic flute at the same time he's writing it so that maybe the masonic ideas are very much at the forefront of his head it's also of course he's writing it for this great friend of his um you mentioned stadler anton stadler this pioneering clarinet virtuoso who he called um red current face that was his nickname for him the ribby <laughs> cell um and as you say it, it's a work that just pierces you through every time you listen to it as well as the incredible sensuous beauty which most like always seem to get whenever he put clarinets into his orchestra um, or as a solo instrument, there's this particular vein of expressive, sensuous beauty, which, um, you know, you think of the Countess's music in Figaro, perhaps more than anything else, but there's a kind of darkness there that goes beyond that, and a richness. Um, what I love about it, again, in every case, is that he, he was writing for players he knew. When he put clarinets in front of an orchestra, or in a chamber group as a soloist, um, or as a soloist in a concerto, he was, he was writing pretty much always for one of these Stadler brothers um, who were friends of his, he used to socialise with, drank coffee, played billiards, knew them personally, they used to go on, they all travelled to Prague together at one point in a coach and had enormous, basically pissed about like musicians do, you know, <laughs> it's all, and, and all that sort of, not only the sort of sense of friendship and deep understanding of this personality, but also something that goes beyond that, this enormous respect clearly for the man's artistry. Um, that comes through in Mozart's clarinet music. Um, you know, clearly he, he sort of saw the funny side, and you hear that very obviously in the clarinet's finale, um, but all in the clarinet concerto's finale. But um, also, this, this sort of deep, deep love and respect for the sound he made, the man's artistry that just express, you know, make, leads to music that is so expressive. And and it's not just, I say, it's not just in um, in the clarinet concerto. Things like the A major piano concerto number twenty-three, the E flat major clarinet concerto number twenty-two, both have clarinets in the orchestra, and they create this completely different, sensuous, um, warm world. Uh, the Thirty-Nine Symphony of the trilogy of late symphonies. That's the one with the clarinets in it, and again, it completely changes the colour, the tone, the sort of softness of the music. Um, and then there's the chain music. You mentioned the Kegelstadt trio, but also the clarinet quintet. I mean, there's some of the most sonically adventurous and at the same time sonically beautiful pieces of shade music ever written and the clarinet concerto sort of stands at the end of that line and yet all that achievement goes into the clarinet concerto with this sort of darkness and 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 profound you know sort of wisdom and last piece he wrote he, thing is think remember is he didn't know it was the last piece he wrote and there's a fabulous letter of his um where he describes basically i think he's writing to constanza she's gone off to a health resort for the summer um, he's back in Vienna getting the concerto finished. And he just says, well, went down to the pub, um, played billiards, smoked a fantastic pipe of tobacco. Then I had them bring some coffee up, sat down, finished the rondo for Stadler. Um, and that's, that's what he says about the clarinet concerto. He's not a man who's planning on dying, however profound we think the music is. Uh, this is a guy who's loving life and loving music and absolutely at the top of his game. 
I was, I'm uh, always reminded of, of a comment that Pete, Peter Cropper used to say, where he was, he, there was a huge debate once in Sheffield about is the, is the saddest music in the world in a major key. Yeah. And I think that slow movement, it's impossible to describe it in, 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 in words, you'd need a great poet. But um, there's something about the fact that it's so achingly sad and yet it's in a major key. Of course, that is a, that is a, um, a device that, that Gluck used in something like Che Faro Senza Eredice. Um, and Mozart was probably aware of that, of, that, of that sort of nobility of writing in a major key, something prof with a profound poetic statement. Of course, the, the, where, the, where the melody from the second movement comes back after a short Eingang <clears throat> mini cadenza um, is one of the great challenges for a clarinetist um, and one of the great moments in all music, I would say. I think it goes beyond just being a concerto for anything or any kind of discussion about comparison. It goes to, it goes to one of the highest achievements of art by a human being that that moment that particular moment in time it's almost i find it almost impossible to breathe during it well one of the one of the last things i want to say about it was that i listened to a few recordings again and uh, i love jack brimer's recording with some uh, st martin in the fields with neville mariner because rather than going for authenticity they just go for the music and I love that. It just shines through in that recording. I think that's probably his number two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just sublime, merely sublime. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. We, yeah. we, let's move on. Nick, another, another choice from you. I, I need to put on the table the oboe concerto written for me by John Woolrich. Um, this, this was a piece which came at a, a point of collaboration where John had written quite a number of pieces for me. And I just, I mean, I'm not taking responsibility for the fact that it exists at all, but I'm saying that I, I get to know my composers very well. I mean, some of them want to be more distant. That's totally fine. For the first time John Taverner wrote for me, it just came to the letterbox and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> um, but with John, it was a question of, I really getting to know him personally. He got to know my family. He knew my, my mum, he knew my dad, all long gone. And, um, I always felt that something about John's voice would, would lead to a big expression. One of the things that is needed in, in our repertoire, the oboe repertoire, is, is big statement pieces. So pieces that pack the most uncompromising emotional punch. Um, because I, I, don't have, I don't set myself limits to where the instrument can go. I'm, I'm prepared to experiment with that. I mean, I, I love to play Madeleine Dring as well because it's classy and brilliant and Johnny and Clear would have loved it. But it's at the same time, if I think that a composer might have something that great in them, I'm going to do everything in my power to make it happen. And it just so happened that his sort of brother-in-law, the, the brother of his partner was Nick Kenyon, who was running the proms and Nick agreed to commission it. So John didn't really send me parts of it. I just got the whole score in one, maybe a few months before the concert. And it was very hard to, to understand what he'd written. But then when I looked at the individual instruments and the colours he was using, I realised that this was something very big. It's a huge orchestra um, with a triple woodwind, triple, uh, triple brass, a massive percussion section. It starts with a Verdi bass drum, has lion's roar, it's on off scaffold feet, oxygen cylinders, the Woolrich percussion that, that anybody knows about that, that you know, it's, uh, is, is very particular to him. Um, and he uses all of it. There's a whole uh, solo section with, uh, with a water fern. Um, so then, we, then you get to, this is the, always the way these things happen. You, you get to two or three, maybe three days before the world premiere and you go to Maida Vale for a rehearsal. And, you know, I've had no time to, to sort of hear the piece in my head because there's been no prior rehearsal. I mean, in the old days when you used to occasionally get a, you know, uh, a very, very good amateur orchestra would, would try things through with you, but not with a world premiere, that wasn't possible. And it's, it's less possible these days. Anyway, I mean, the piece starts and I just couldn't believe what I was in the middle of. I, I thought I'd come to another planet. And um, there's so many, so much richness in the piece, so much, uh, which is the essence of concerto, which is some kind of struggle between the single voice and the large group. He turns it into a kind of snuff movie, actually, at the end. Every single time I've played that piece, I've, I've, even though I know when the last chord is coming, it, it gives me the most enormous shock. 
I was never more glad than when he wrote this sort of ceremonial towards the end. There's this extraordinary repeating ceremonial um, eight bar phrase with which is in four and then the the bar before the repeat is in three with a big crescendo so it it i've never more been more glad that he didn't write anything for me to play during that because quite honestly i mean in the first performance i was just you know <laughs> gone is that one of those one of those pieces that when the composer comes on stage and he's written that i mean there are some real challenges in the piece he's written that and he's sort of somehow managed to do it and you, and you look him in the face and he looks you back without saying a word and you know you did well <laughs> just because he's, you know, he, he, John's a man of few words and many notes. So that for me is, I, I mean, I've had so many great pieces and it's agony to choose it over so many incredible pieces, but that is something incredibly special for me. Wonderful. I'm so pleased you, you picked that one. I'm a big fan of John Woolwich's work and played a, a, quite a bit of it as well. I think he, I was going to say, uh, you said about a man of few words and lots of notes. That's absolutely the way I think of him. <laughs> and the way he looks in the, when he's in the audience, you're never quite sure what he's thinking. But, uh, anyway, one, wonderful, wonderful choice. Fiona, another choice from you. Well, I'd like to say first that that's exactly the kind of introduction to a piece that I was hoping I'd get mm. today because <laughs> I do know quite a lot of... John Woolwich's music. I don't know that piece, but wow, what a what a description. Um, I'm going to choose an oboe concerto because obviously I want to keep in with Nick. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I'm I'm choosing the Richard Strauss oboe concerto, uh, written late in his life and written, I think, although Nick will fill us in on all this, um, uh, after meeting an American soldier, I believe, uh, and who who must in other in another life have been an oboist and who basically said how about writing an oboe concerto to which I'm sure Strauss said no and went away and, and, and did it so it's a late work it's to me it's it's full of um it it, it it's not a neither a case to put for it or def a defense of it it's but it's very operatic you can hear so much of a work like Capriccio in it um written around you know, late, late as well, and it's got that strange way that Strauss, you, he enmeshes textures so richly, so that it's quite hard to find out where the line is, and yet you can always tell. It, it's a, I, I've, I haven't, I've played a little of, of Strauss's music in in orchestras, and it always sounds before you play it as though it's very clear what's happening and then you go into playing it and, and you can't believe that he's he's making so many complex patterns out of which some serene melody arises and that's how I, I uh, it's also very it's got a lot of exuberance in it um, and and Nick you must have played it more times than you can count. <laughs> yes I mean I the only reason it's I mean, I guess it probably it must be on my list in a way because it's my it's my what my kids call the money earner. <laughs> <laughs> the money Ooh, it's maker. quite nice as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not really. I mean, certainly not right now. <laughs> yes, and it was actually the oboist, the the soldier who commissioned it. Um, well, who who asked for it, John Delancey, who then became the principal oboe in the Philadelphia Orchestra and actually the head of Curtis. Um, and he, there was a big saga with Delancey because, in fact, he wrote it in the end for Marcel Saye and the Tonhalle. And it's interesting because I played it once um, with Richard Hickox in the Tonhalle with exactly the right size string section that uh, Strauss asked for. So I can't remember what the numbers are now. It's written on the front of my music. And that was wonderful because it was exactly the right scale for that hall. That hall is so small. I mean, if you put a Mahler symphony there, it must be absolutely obliterating, I would have thought. But anyway, that's another subject. But it, it, is, it is a piece, I think, I mean, one of the things that I love about it is is where it sits just before Metamorphosen, and there's this um, in the first movement. There's 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 all these times when it goes, so he starts on an A and goes down a simple scale, but in fact that has the deepest connection to Metamorphosen, which in itself has a deep connection to the oboe solo from the Eroica Symphony of Beethoven. Um, and of course, he quotes that as as everybody knows at the end of Metamorphosis. 
it's somehow as though the oboe set off a train, a, a chain reaction of things, um, which the end result is probably for our songs in terms of just the, the sheer outpouring of, of, of melody. But um, the oboe concerto, as you say, it's, it's got some wonderful ex exuberance in it too. Um, but there's the, also this fantastic way that he, he, again, in a major key, writes such sad and achingly beautiful melody. For me, I love the way that he always delays the gratification of the tonic chord. So you can arrive at the climax in the top instruments um, and the bass has not resolved. It's still on the dominance. It's on the fifth. And you've resolved, and then the bass finally brings you kind of to rest a few buzz later um, in a way that just is so, oh, it's, it's, it's uber controlling, and yet it's it just right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to bring in a saxophone concerto, and it's by Dominic Muldowney, who I love as a composer, and he doesn't work anywhere near enough or have anywhere near enough um, performances, I don't think. Uh, never has done. But I first heard the saxophone concerto, which was uh, almost inevitably performed by John Hall, as almost every saxophone concerto was in the 80s. Uh, he was just such, like Nick, you know, he, he was responsible for, for expanding the repertoire of that instrument massively um, in his time. Uh, this was done at one of, the, one of the greatest proms I think I've ever been to. It was in 1984. It was a three-part prom. Uh, it started with um, Hindemith and Olli Nussen's second symphony. Then we have the percussion ensemble Nexus uh, from Canada, who uh, many of whom were in the Steve Reich ensemble. They played, um, and they played Steve Reich and they played uh, Cage and they played Takamitsu. We had, uh, then, then it finished um, with Ligeti Aventure and Nouveau Aventure and the saxophone concerto of Dominic Muldowney. I mean, that, that's a night of music, that is. And I was, I think, 12 at the time. I just couldn't believe it. I, it was just the most fantastic thing ever. And getting to know John Hull, uh, as I did uh, many, many years later as a, as a good friend, I'm always keen to remind him that uh, I was the 12-year-old that went up to him and asked him for his autograph in the rehearsal because um, <laughs> I was one of those. I also, got all, I also got the autographs of all of the, the BBC Symphony Orchestra percussionists because I was so in awe of them. Were, anyway, were you they, quite annoying, do you think? No, I, don't, I, I don't think I was. I, I think, to be honest, none of them had ever... Most people didn't ask for autographs for people like that, uh, you know, so I think, they okay. were quite, I think they were quite flattered, to be honest. Well, that's the way I'm thinking of it anyway. Anyway, the, the saxophone... Dominic Muldowney, is, I think, is a brilliant writer. He's very direct... Uh, right, so it just connects, I think, has an ability to connect with the audience very uh, directly. And um, this concerto, I think there's always a, perhaps a, a, a tendency with saxophone concertos to always look at the jazz in music. There's always, always got to be a bit of a jazzy uh, bit in, in, the, in the concerto of almost anyone who's ever written for the instrument. Of course, I suppose that's inevitable. But here, Dominic Moldani uses really the music of the 20s, in Berlin, it's that kind of feel. It's the Kurt Weill sort of era uh, of jazz. It's that that sense, but only slightly. It's only really like a, I don't know. It's an undercurrent. It's just there, but it's not really the most important part of it. I thought it was a knockout piece. Actually, I, I really connected with it. Very, he is very a great cool. composer. He he is a great composer. He's also a very he's an incredibly able composer. Remember all that work he did for the National Theatre in the 70s and 80s um, yes. and that was a lot of that was for for double reed band because they had this incredible double reed band and then George Caird my teacher used to go almost every night for an hour to the National Theatre where they played Bert Whistle and Dominic Muldowney and, and all these things I was like wow but <laughs> Dominic owes me a concerto actually I have to tell you he owes me a concerto for oboe violin and baroque strings okay well I'm, I hope he's listening <laughs> he could get on with it <laughs> but I, anyway i would i would highly recommend the uh hmm. the, the saxophone concerto it, it essentially disappeared it's one of those pieces that had a really great impact when it was played uh once and then sort of disappeared and with john hall commissioning lots and lots of other pieces as well and becoming very successful as a, as a soloist there were so many other pieces to play it didn't really i don't think get the uh the plaudits it, it deserved and then it was re-released um, on the front cover, I think, of the BBC Music magazine, not that long ago, actually. Uh, and I'm, that performance? I'm, yeah, it that was that performance. performance. Oh, really? Was, wow, yeah. It was that performance. And I, I'm rather hoping that, you know, Respect. John Hart's protege, uh, Jess Gillam, might, might get to it at some point as well, because I think it definitely deserves 
um, a, a, a new interpretation and, and some new audiences for that. Um, Richard, a choice from you. Um, well, can I, can I just throw in a couple of other saxophone concertos? Please do. First, um, I mean, you mentioned, uh, the first one I, I, I came across, it, it's been around for a long while, but I only came across it relatively recently, which was by Richard Rodney Bennett, um, his concerto for Stan Getz, he called it. Yeah. Um, um, which, uh, uh, as you say, it's, you can't really get away with not writing jazz in a clarinet, in a saxophone concerto. And Richard Rodney Bennett, of course, had the advantage in that regard of being a phenomenal jazz musician in his own right, a jazz pianist. Um, and it is the most, um, I say, it, it sort of, it has, I say, it's your spiky, rhythmically driven, exciting, dynamic outer movements. Um, the central movement is a real one, this sort of silky, smoky, um, moody blues of a movement, which, I mean, it's absolutely full of the essence of the blues and the essence of jazz at any point lapsing into what you might call pastiche, the most gorgeous sort of shimmering orchestral writing around this long, lyrical, bluesy saxophone lines that never for a moment sound like they're kind of sticking on the style um, or, or, or sort of patronising it. Um, and the other one, which is a, this is a soft spot of mine, a musical soft spot of mine, because I thought I, I've been trying to get it in for weeks and I've never had the chance. Um, and it's a saxophone concerto without the slightest hint of jazz or probably the slightest awareness of jazz, um, which is still a masterpiece. And it's uh, Glazunov's saxophone concerto, uh, which I think if I'm correct, he wrote in the late 1920s or early 1930s, not long before his death. Uh, he'd left Russia. He's in exile in Paris. But this is... That rarest of thing, it's a Russian romantic, a Russian romantic wind concerto. I mean, I can <laughs> rack my brains. I can only think of, um, and I'm not sure they really count, Aratunian's trumpet concerto and um, Glier's horn concerto. I really couldn't think of any other um, thing, wind concertos by Russian composers that are even close to the repertoire. Um, apart from this Glasnov saxophone concerto, probably the first major saxophone concerto to really enter the repertoire by a major composer. And he just hears it as a glorious singing voice. Um, I believe it's for, written for a French soloist, um, for whom he also wrote a remarkable saxophone quartet, probably again the earliest that's really in the repertoire today. Again, this is in the late 1920s, early 30s. And um, it is Glasnov being Glasnov. He, he's a Russian romantic um, protégé of Borodin and Rimsky-Korsakov, a child prodigy who kind of um, had a very good revolution, you might say. He sort of bravely stood up for his students in the face of authorities. He's incredibly kind to Shostakovich um, as a student, also incredibly kind to Prokofiev and Stravinsky, who repaid him by being utterly, utterly horrible about him um, and trying to wipe his music out of history, <laughs> which I've done very effectively. Um, then eventually went into exile um, because he just really couldn't get the amount of vodka he needed in post-revolutionary Russia. And um, and here is a saxophone concerto, which is, it's, um, Elgarian is perhaps one way of describing it. It's drenched in nostalgia and also sweetness, and it just sings and sings and sings. It, it sort of gives away to sort of high spirits at the end. So there's this lush, old, um, old Russian nostalgic warmth throughout the piece, which is just the last thing you expect from the sax. And every time I hear it, I'm just very touched by it. It's, it's a very touching, very expressive, beautifully written, uh, very civilised work, um, but at the same time, I think, rather moving. Nick, another choice from you, please. Yes, um, well, it's, it's so, this is agony, but <laughs> I, I have to have Vaughan Williams' oboe concerto in there, and I'm sorry to put two oboe concertos on my list. Yeah. Um, but the thing is that in the same way that with the, the Finzi clarinet concerto, that in a way the work is defined by its slow movement, I think there are two parts of the Vaughan Williams' oboe concerto that define it and lift it to be what Jacqueline Dupre said about it, which was it was the oboist's cello concerto. And she said that when Baron Boy and her then husband was recording it with Neil Black, which is one of the one of the great recordings of it actually. The thing is the end of the first movement has a point a bit like the Allegri Miserere, where it's, it becomes one of those those parts in music where again it's strange for a wind concerto to say it, but you can't breathe. You just don't want to breathe. You don't want to hear your own breathing. It's a bit like um, the air being completely still on a summer's day and nothing quite like breathing or moving. Um, so I, I rather remember that wonderful poem, uh, Adelstrop. Um, the steam hissed, someone cleared his throat. It's just no one moved and no one. It's just wonderful. It, it is English and yet that somehow 
that den almost denigrates it by calling it English. It's it's global, and universal, and and exquisite and vocal. And then, of course, the piece is is really two concertos because the first movement stands completely on its own in a way, almost like a Sibelius tone poem. And of course, he was writing the Fifth Symphony at this time, which is dedicated to, to Sibelius. And um, so he may have been thinking of Swan of Tuonela or, or some of these, you know. Uh, Law Natar, the, maybe these great Sibelius turn poems when he wrote it. But the first movement stands as one thing. The second and third movements are two, part of, two parts of the same story. The second movement is an archaic minuet with a musette drone. In other words, you're going back to the oboes. We've lost the bag some centuries ago, but when we used to have a bag to buff the air out. Um, and then the third movement is also in a very much faster, more, more mid 20th century, quite sort of uh, new world uh, active, very fast three. But the third movement is actually a scherzo with two trios, which are connected by way of metric modulation. It's one of the earliest um, times I can think I've seen a metric modulation. And of course, the old way of writing it is, is the wrong way around compared to the Eliot Carter version, as we know. But the, the first of the slower sections is, uh, is twice as slow. And the, the uh, lento, the, the last section, the last sort of variation, which I think is one of the, what, again, one of the single most beautiful pieces in, in British music is exactly three times so, slower. So you have the sense of the da 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 and you have that sense, even when you're going one, two, three, and that's the pulse, one. You sort of da 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 You've got that, so there's sort of a way in which it's pleasing mathematically, if you can get it right um, in terms of the tempo, which unfortunately, a lot of people do it, but I try to. Um, but it's 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 a work that I've I, so often when I play it, I remember an occasion recently I played it in Malvern Priory, and um, and I, often if you're playing it in a summer festival or something, you're you're in the in a church or a cathedral, in fact Salisbury Cathedral, I did it where I, I was a boy, and you're looking down at the 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 um, West End. And so often the sun is setting just as you've done the overture and you go on to do the concerto. And just at that sort of mid to late summertime, the sun is setting. And through all the stained glass, you get this incredible, in very inspiring light. So, so often I've played it with my own light show that none of the audience are looking at. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful piece. I mean, it's really, it's, it's been good to me and I hope I've tried, to, I've tried to be good to it too. Fiona, let's go to you again for another choice. Well, to continue this theme, um, I've chosen the Vaughan Williams Tuba Concerto. I think someone had to. Eight. <laughs> and um, I, I realised that I had a very ignorant idea of what the tuba was capable of. Um, I, I think we, we, we see it and there's, it, it's all, often doing a sort of thump, thump, thump sort of sound or that's what we pick up and we don't realize unless we're brass players which as i'm self-evidently not um i i I don't think we see its ability to be nimble to dance to sing and the the vaughan williams tuba concerto written at the very end of his life and i gather one of the most popular works for the instrument and (laughs) possibly one of the most popular works he wrote, I don't know, um, or most played. Um, it, it's, it's got so many colours in it. And it, when, when I first got to know it, I thought, how will it sound like Vaughan Williams, a tuba concerto? I couldn't match it somehow. But the minute it starts, you, 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 believe, you believe in it. And it, it, uh, it has a, a, a sort of melancholy aspect. It has a bit that's a bit like teddy bear's picnic it has a you know sort of jaunty passage it has elegant trills and runs that i simply was my breath was taken away in a literal sense listening to it so i i think it's a a, a wonderful piece and with so much poetry in it and i I, i'm ashamed that i didn't realize that the tuba was capable of that (laughs) so i'm playing my penance here I think I think that's wonderful, Fiona, and, and I'm particularly pleased because I've also chosen I've chosen another tuba concerto as well. But the, the the Vaughan Williams was an absolute key work. It sort of opened up that world to composers as well to think, well, yes, actually, maybe I can I can do that too. Two two of my oldest friends in the world are tuba players. I have an unhealthy 
knowledge of the tuba repertoire. Well, I um, had an unhealthy ignorance. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I used to, uh, when, when I was at the, the academy and I, I lived with a, a tuba player, um, Nick Etheridge, who's a very fine player, um, I used to write out the tuba parts in all the great works. So like um, Turangalila Symphony and uh, War Requiem, I think I did as well. I used to write them out because I used to love doing copy, music copying anyway. So write them out for him so that he could just practice his part and not have to read the, the full score. Um, so I got to know the tuba parts of that very, very well as well. But my tuba concerto is Edward Gregson's tuba concerto. Um, I love Eddie Gregson's music. It's so open and generous and um, he, he was a tutor at the Royal Academy uh, when I was there and I had a few uh, difficulties there uh, which ended up with me leaving but he was always uh, one of the only ones that really stuck up for me and I always remember that but I loved his music I really I really knew his music because I was in the Kent Youth Wind Orchestra and we played a lot of Gregson in wind orchestras because he, he's one of the big composers in that in that world uh, and the tuba concerto we played, I think it was in 1986 or seven, I can't remember exactly, at the Queen Elizabeth Hall with the soloist John Fletcher. Um, John Fletcher, one of the greatest of all um, tuba players, and uh, I mean, he was in the Philip Jones Brass Ensemble, famously principal of the LSO, but he was a god to us. And when he came on the stage, I mean, we used to think we were pretty cool about all of this stuff. He comes on, we were used, we, it, we were, if we hadn't just got us gone down on our knees and you know and bowed to, in front of him I wouldn't have been surprised it was so amazing to play behind him and that was the year he died by the way it was really it was only a matter of months before before he died as he, and he died very very suddenly at a silly early age but just as a pure experience that was amazing but I think it's a wonderful piece it's got some wonderful tunes great <laughs> themes beautifully orchestrated in whichever version uh, one listens to it because there's a wind band version there's a brass band version um, I think it's a lovely generous act of music that uh, can just be enjoyed by anybody Richard I was just going to say I mean I, I think the first time I heard the Gregson tube concerto I was I think an old colleague of mine from the Merseyside Youth Orchestra, Kevin Norbury, was playing it in the finals of BBC Young Musician. And I just heard those opening bars. And I just, I just started giggling. So I just thought, "Thunderbirds are go." It's um, <laughs> not a bad thing to think. But it's, I was interested. What Fiona was saying, I was underestimating um, what a tuba can do. I mean, I was very lucky. I had this sort of early master class um, in the Merseyside Youth Orchestra because we had in our orchestra this fantastic tuba player, Kevin Norbury, who made it to the finals of BBC Young Musician, I think maybe in the first tuba player ever to do so. Um, and he, he was our tuba player. And uh, we went on tour with him as soloist in the Vaughan Williams. Um, we sort of toured it around Austria. And uh, he used to amuse us all, so before going on stage, um, he must have been about 17 or 18 at the time, he used to amuse us by playing um, excerpts from great violin concertos on the tuba. So he'd be playing the opening of the Sibelius concerto on his tuba, or the Mendelssohn concerto. <laughs> And then we walk out on we, we go out on stage, we play our overture, and then he would walk out to play his concerto. And I never forget, every time in Austria um, we played the Williams concerto, the minute he walked on stage with the tuba, the audience would start laughing. Mm. They'd dissolve into laughter. <laughs> and they couldn't conceive of the idea of a tuba concerto, the idea of this was a solo instrument, and this was a soloist. And then he'd sit down and he'd, and he'd play that, that glorious slow movement of the BW, which is... I always think I always think you'll believe an elephant can fly. Um, I always think it's like sort of lark ascending in the most improbable and most gorgeously surprising way. Now you it? see, I, I I would pay to hear lark ascending arranged for tuba. Fiona, you wanted to come in here. Yeah, I I was trying to think why I should be so singularly um, ill-informed about these low brass instruments, and I realised that it's partly because it it wasn't a thing that that girls did and. Having gone to a girls' school, nobody played any. I mean, I think one rather odd person played the bassoon, as we considered it then, very odd. Um, but really, there were there were no low brass instruments, and by the time my own daughters were at school, there was a whole trombone ensemble. So I, I'm very glad that things have changed because I'm sure that's one reason why I just didn't encounter the instrument except in Tubby the Tuba. Yeah. Oh, I love Tubby the Tuba. Well, and, and another oh, one. I'm not, my... I'm not talking that down, but uh... <laughs> no, no. I, another one of my oldest friends, Hazel. She's a she's a, a tuba player. Uh, when we were growing up, very young. So actually, uh, I knew female but tuba players. There may have on. been traditions. Mm. I mean, it's it's a literal thing. There might have been a brass band tradition that that 
I, I, I didn't encounter as, as when I was growing up, but, but things change and it's very good that you do now see so many female brass players. Um, we must move on. Nick, was, was the Mozart one of your choices? Because we've definitely yes. covered that. So I think we're yes. on to your final choice, therefore. Has it been finished? <laughs> so painful. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the thing is, it's just such a wonderful piece. I've got to choose it. It's, it's the Haydn Trumpet Concerto. <laughs> um, I mean, it is just an absolutely knockout piece. It's the reason to have a trumpet concerto. It's like, it, I think, I mean, I, I, of course, I love the Mozart Oboe concerto. I love the Mozart Bassoon, I love the Mozart Flute concertos, and they're great. But honestly, the Haydn is absolute top Haydn. It's Haydn that is absolute best. It's conversational. It, it has the, the post-horn elements in it. And yet the slow movement is just one of the most beautiful iris. I so want to steal it. <laughs> <laughs> I've thought of it. Don't get me wrong. Um, and it's, it's. I think it's just a, a, a superb piece of, of music. And um, when you get his absolute best like that, it's like it's got a, it's got an eloquence and uh, uh, matched with the poetry. Um, the, the, the lines are so beautiful. He, he uses. It's almost like looking at a poem because he sort of he, he states the phrase da 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 da. da. Da, 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 da. And they say so he's always sort of going just beyond in this very elegant way. Um, and uh, gosh, it, it's got so many great things about it. Um, and of course, there's been some fantastic recordings of it over the last few years. I mean, starting with Maurice Andre, but then going on to you know Allison and, and all these great people, John Wallace, and, it's, and, and Hawkeye Hardenberger. It's it's a it's a just a majestic piece, but I'm in so much pain at leaving out <laughs> so many amazing well, pieces. Don't, I don't mean, worry I about that. Mention one piece that isn't on my list, please. Well, no, we're, I we're have to do... mention Hugh Watkins's flute concerto. No, ah! I'm I'm going to mention Hugh Watkins's flute concerto oh, as well. But we're going to do God. we'll do a round up at the end, Nick. Don't don't <laughs> don't fret. We'll be all right. It, it, you'll be able to get them oh. all in, uh, including okay. that one. But I wrote down the first, the first things I wrote down when we knew we were doing this was that. I wrote down, RB will choose Haydn trumpet. Richard, did you choose the Haydn trumpet? Oh, absolutely. But I mean, <laughs> Nicholas has said it all. It's, it's perfect. It is perfect. It's not a, a wasted note. It's, um, Haydn wrote a few concertos over his career. I mean, as a cellist, I've encountered the two cello concertos. You never quite feel you're getting Haydn at the absolute peak of his game, much as you love them. Um, much as you want to engage with them. The, the, um, the trumpet concerto is from the 17, I think 1796, so it's right at that glorious final peak of his career when he was turning up the London symphonies, the Opera 76 quartet, um, the late piano trios, um, the creation, all that genius just distilled. It's not a wasted note, it's concise, all the melodies tell, all the melodies are beautiful. And as Nicholas said, this sort of craftsmanship of sort of po quiet poetry. I mean, just the first bars, playing it in the orchestra, I remember, um, well, I made, a, I made a string orchestra arrangement of it once so we could do it at school with a, with a friend who's a trumpeter. And um, um, that, those first bars, you know, da, 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 but down under there in the orchestra, you've got this glorious little second violin like going, da, Bum, bum, bum. Just bum, bum. slots in the whole the whole piece has that level of wit and craftsmanship and the, the finale is you know it's a classic witty Haydn finale that the melody of the slow movements is as lovely as anything he ever wrote it's poignant and it's just perfectly gauged perfectly paced and um and apparently he wrote it for this experimental instrument this sort of weird looking bit of metallic plumbing you occasionally see an instrument museum it's called an organized trumpet which almost looks a bit like a sort of wonky saxophone um sort of an early attempt at a valve trumpet which didn't really last very long or work and there he is he's seen this this composer getting on for his 70s um sees this extraordinary strange non-functioning new concert new instrument assimilates it listens to the player who can play it and and just creates something perfect for it first time straight off out of nowhere I mean, that's that's incredible isn't it and what a joy that piece is Fiona, do I get the impression you'd chosen it too? I, I did cho choose it. What can I possibly add to what's been said? I, I can only say my own knowledge of it goes back to, uh, was one of the first pieces I ever heard, but I only heard the last movement. And so it was an, a, a real revelation and joy to discover <laughs> there were two other movements. Um, <laughs> I, I, that was I, the same with me with Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, <laughs> I have to say, when I was six. <laughs> The, 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 the last movement is, it has, has a lot of sort of Proustian moments uh, for me, but uh, yeah, a great, perfect piece that was in fact the first thing I wrote down. 
on my I list. Want, I want to bring in Copeland's clarinet concerto as another piece just for pure joy, really. Again, this sort of joy of making music. Um, the piece starts so slowly and it's sort of like a flower that just opens up very, very slowly in the morning. Um, it takes its time. It's very melodic. It's uh, it got very long clarinet lines and then it starts to be spiky just very slowly starts to get spikier and spikier and then a little bit jazzier, a little bit jazzier and syncopated in that, you know, very Copeland-esque way. I love it as a piece. I think it's one and it's scored very lightly because it's just for clarinet and string orchestra. Um, Harp. And harps, yes, sorry. Um, so be beautifully orchestrated, beautifully handled. And as I say, it's just one of those pieces to sit down and just think, uh, this is a wonderful, lovely thing to listen to. It doesn't challenge you too much. Beautifully written instrument. I do, uh, I mean, there's lots and lots of recordings, of course. Um, I'm quite partial to the ben Benny Goodman recordings of all, of all the pieces, actually, that were mostly written for Woody Herman, but he ended up doing. Um, and uh, Ebony Concerto is another one, of course, Stravinsky. The Britain. Uh, Yes, yes. Britain concerto movement, which I think is uh, it's the saddest loss in a way that that doesn't exist, that piece, that whole piece. The, uh, but I, I love Benny Goodman's playing. It's not as secure uh, technically, I don't think, as I mean, certainly not as many of the, of the players, uh, uh, you know, as if you like the real classical soloist players. But there's something about it in the heart of the playing and the, the sound of it that I, that I really, really enjoy. Um, and so I, I wanted to mention Ebony Concerto as well, because that's just a work of total genius. Uh, Nick, you wanted to mention some that you that you didn't choose in your top five. Yes, but... absolutely. Yes. Well, I mean, there's I thought I'd just quickly go through. Oh. I mean, in flute, with flute concertos, because I've, I've been a bit mean to the flute. <laughs> I think that Hugh Watkins is flute concerto written for Adam Walker, recorded on an MC by the Halle Orchestra, uh, is, is an absolutely superb piece. And I... I when it came out, I thought I must make time to really get to know that. Didn't do it. Did it just recently. And I, I mean, I, I was in the kitchen listening to it. And my husband came and said, you're listening to flute? <laughs> Which is a bit surprising. But it's the most wonderful piece. I mean, it's, it's and the performance Adam Walker gives of it is, is just right. It's the most wonderful piece. Another great piece by Christopher Rouse, Flute Concerto, which I think is, was tremendously um, beautifully done. Um, and then, yes, Copeland, goodness me, yes. And I think Thea Musgrave's mm. clarinet concerto is yes. also hard to get out of one's head. Somehow it's such a powerfully argued piece. Well, and um, also, just it's with so great, but, but uh, Thea Musgrave's piece is so great to watch as well because the clarinet yeah. walks around the stage um, working with certain sections of the orchestra. It's just a fascinating architecture of a piece to watch. There's, there's one terrible story about that, which I'm not sure I can actually say <laughs> we're all ears oh, should. okay so Gervais de Pire was the dedicatee and Gervais was a brilliant soloist but he's not always the most popular person with other players I mean I don't know quite why that was I, he was seen quite nice to me but um during the world premiere at the Albert Hall of that piece um which I believe it may have been conducting Gervais de Pire got to the station next to the French horns and his music was gone and there was a note from Alan Civil saying Gervais, you, and then a four-letter word, which is not repeatable on modern, <laughs> modern technology. Oh, Alan Civil was known for stuff like that, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, but I mean, that's a terrible thing to do to somebody in a world premiere. <laughs> anyway, carrying swiftly on, uh, <laughs> Lutosławski Oboe and Harp Concerto. I was privileged to play that with the composer quite a few times. And I recorded it a while ago with the Lutosławski Philharmonic, which is the Rotswav film. Um, in Poland and we actually did it without conductor which was really interesting but it's a great scoring for just strings and percussion these days we're all looking at slightly smaller scorings of things things we can do safely and I hope that piece comes out David Matthews is oboe concerto James McMillan's oboe concerto and Nigel Osborne I mean just I, there's a long list of great pieces well, written for me one one thing I wanted to mention what was in, I thought was interesting when researching for this is uh, how many new pieces there are for instruments that have been commissioned by so few people. So, for example, trombones, trombone concertos, I mean, nearly all of them are Christian Lindbergh performing mm. them. Uh, trumpet concertos, nearly all of them, Hawk and Hardenberger. Oboe concertos, it's you, Nick, uh, Michael Collins. There's, there's a large repertoire 
that's been written for a very small number of people, which seems very significant. Yeah, well, I think it's we're just lucky, lucky people that people believe in us. Um, I mean, in a way, what you've described is a fault. Um, but there are there are some great other oboists, Melinda Maxwell and Gareth Halson, have all commissioned incredible, and many others commissioned great work. I think the, the point is that to an extent, one's looking at one's legacy um, and and the future of the students I teach, and that I want them to have every opportunity to to have a repertoire that hopefully people will will enjoy. Yeah. Um, there's one piece I really really want to talk about quickly, which is the Jolivet Bassoon Concerto which is actually one of the most terrific wind concertos. And it's a particular recording of it that if you're going to get to know it, you need to listen to with Maurice Allard and the conductor composing. And this is a, a concerto written for French bassoon rather than the German bassoon that we more often hear in this country and in Germany. And the French bassoon is a very special beast with very special qualities. Um, and it's just the most wonderful piece. Jolivet is not the most c currently trending composer, but I think he's written some great music. And actually for Winds particularly, this is a truly inspirational piece. I do recommend it. Fiona, I think you wanted to come in before. Uh, I was just going to add as another uh, relatively recent clarinet concerto, the one by Magnus Lindbergh, which uh, I think is uh, oh, yeah. a wonderful piece, written uh, in 2002 and played... I think quite a lot. I, I've only heard it a, a couple of times, but it's incredibly virtuosic and it extends the techniques of the instrument and has a, a, is, is perpetually interesting. It's it's a it's a, a real showpiece. Richard, any we've left out from you briefly? Uh, well, Fiona has has um, saved me having to mention the Magnus Lindbergh. Um, clarinet concerto with another great Scandinavian concerto we can't leave out surely is, is the Nielsen clarinet concerto when the um, you know it's incredibly uproarious impertinent work in which a, the clarinetist sort of fights it out with an impertinent um, side drummer um, against an orchestral background it's so Nielsen it's so bolshy it's so spiky it's so full of life so full of energy so full of cheek uh, and so full of courage as well uh, I'm playing it must be a hell of an experience um, <laughs> Um, there's one other kind of concerto, um, Weber's first in F minor, which is, you know, that's the birth of romanticism, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, you're deep in the German forest. This has got all, everything you'd want from Weber in a clarinet concerto. It's moody, it's dark, it's brooding. It's an amazing passage of a slow movement um, where he sort of duets against three horns, just sort of deep in the forest. Um, and then it just kicks off into this bonkers comic opera finale. It's, it's huge fun. Um, and um, I heard that I, I had I played that as, in the youth orchestra as a boy with, with Joanna Patton, of, who is now in CBSO as soloist, um, and when she was about sixteen, and it delighted me then, still delights me. And finally, I mean, I'm, as a former horn player, I can can't not mention all these lovely horn concertos we all seem to have unaccountably mm, I know. missed out. I mean, no, no, Mozart. I, I haven't. I, yeah. Strauss two. Oh, Strauss. oh. Well, Strauss one was going to be my choice simply because. I mean, I don't know. I think um, there are lots of Richard Strauss's. We've talked today about the late Richard Strauss, the, the Obo Concerto, which is, again, basically perfect. And he wrote a second Hall Concerto at that time, which um, is, I think, one of the hardest in the repertoire. But then there's also this Richard Strauss we all forget, which was the sort of uh, uh, pre-Don Juan Richard Strauss, this sort of young German romantic composer in the tradition of Brahms and Weber, who was just starting to break through into this radical firebrand who's going to set the world on fire and the first horn concerto by by, by strauss again it's perfect it's about 15 minutes um it's absolutely breathes that world of german romanticism but with that element of straussian cheek and audacity i mean his his father franz was i think one of the greatest horn players of the 19th century he played in the premiere of um tristan and isolde even though he despised and hated wagner and his music um he sort of played it just to show that as the greatest horn player of that time he was going to be the man to play those solos um and he sort of brought richard up in this traditional way of writing things and this concerto uh, comes out of that tradition. It, it could have been written by Weber, could have almost perhaps have been written by Mozart, but it's clearly Strauss. And the finale is just, you know, it's Till Oil and Spiegel in a nutshell, it's in embryo. Um, and it's it's the closest I've ever got to playing a Richard Strauss concerto, which is in my bedroom um, very badly, very slowly, and hoping no one was listening, but still loving it. <laughs> um, Strauss is the reason you'd want to take up the horn, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the only one of, of my list that hasn't been mentioned, I, I'm so pleased you mentioned the Hugh Watkins flute concerto, Nick. I chose it actually in an earlier edition of this programme 
uh, with works that were written since 1980. Because I, I thought it was, I thought it was an instant classic. Uh, the premiere, yeah. just, it's one of those moments at the end where you just think that's an instant classic. I really hope everybody takes this up and plays it all over the world. Uh, but the, the other one was H.K. Gruber um, Aerial oh. Concerto, which is a tropical yeah. concerto. Mm. I love, I love Gnarly's music anyway uh, because it's always completely bonkers. Uh, I like him because he's completely bonkers. I went to uh, make a film about, about him for Boozy and Hawks in Vienna where he spent almost the entire time slagging off Vienna and how much he hated it, even though he's lived there all this time. And I, saw, I asked him, well, why, why do you, if you don't like it, why do you live here? And he said, well, what else would I write about? And that's all in the music. He, he needs that a conflict. He needs that tension. And then that amazing over-the-top personality that he has that is in every note of his music. And the Aero Concertos, actually a really great place to start with his music, I think. I uh, would, would very much highly recommend that. Anyway, listen, we've, we've, oh, go on, Richard, I'll let you in. This is my sole creative claim to fame in the world of contemporary classical music, which is that um, um, Gruber was working on Ariel when he was conducting Birmingham Contemporary Music Group in about 1999, and um, I booked the studio um, for him to work on his concerto. In. <laughs> I, yeah, I made yeah. the space available, I put it in the diary, it's, and it's... Uh, that is my sole contribution to contemporary brass music. I love that. Without you, he would not have had the space to create <laughs> music. How wonderful. <laughs> Nick? That's that, yeah. That's no, it's, it's, it's fine. I think we're out of time. I just, just wanted to say about... Um, the Sebastian Fagelund bassoon concerto, which I, which won a BBC um, music magazine award just recently, and I think it's tremendously good. And I've just, you know, I really hope composers start writing more for the bassoon. It's just such a great instrument. And and I think um, just mentioning another uh, young musician, um, uh, Jess Gillen, I think it it's going to take personalities like that isn't it that, that are going to be able to get composers to write for these instruments ben uh, for, ben Schneider, horn yeah, for the as well. horn player these these personalities that, that can persuade uh, composers new a new generation of composers to create to create concertos for them nick i wanted to just very briefly before we finish ask you uh, about the wigmore hall because you were part of this wigmore hall series yes. of recitals that have been done in lockdown mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. on the stage there in front of only Andrew McGregor, probably uh, from Radio 3 or whoever it was presenting on that moment. But how and was John that? Gahooli. <laughs> and John, John Gahooli, who uh, runs, runs yeah. the hall. How, how was that experience for you? Oh, it was a multifaceted experience. I mean, it was a huge privilege to, to, to go and play because you really, I really, having thought about what it meant to go and just play and knowing so many of your loved ones who, I hadn't seen for so for so many months would be listening um and and the world to an extent so the program mattered hugely to me that it that it said it, it was comforting that it was in, in an extent challenging that it, it had it had color and 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 presence to it and, and it was wonderful to play with julius but it was a huge mountain to climb and i, I was in touch with many of the people who performed to wish them luck, to say well done. I mean, I've never had a post, never had a post band like it. Seriously, it was just extraordinary, wonderful, and incredibly heartwarming. But it was literally like, okay, so you're hiding in your house, hoping not to die, and now you're going on the Wigmore Hall stage. <laughs> Let's do those two things next door to each other, shall we? So it was, it was immense, and in, I was absolutely exhausted afterwards. This whole thing for me has been unbelievably tiring that every day is a new kind of shock even if it's looks as though it's getting better in some way it's still a shock and this and you know i've been working every week with my students in germany via this this platform zoom and um seeing the way that they've been in and out of stressful times we've just got to be gentle with ourselves I think that's the thing but it was it was wonderful to do it i'm so incredibly grateful i mean actually now this week i'm missing them because they become part of my lunch times, <laughs> my, my, not eating, but lunchtime regime to, to sit and actually right here and just listen to them here. The wonder, I mean, so many great performances. We all we all felt felt the the honour and, and 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 pride, I think, of doing it. And as a performer, you can't be that happy with the rather watery response from the government in their in well their so called roadmap. I'm naturally a very positive person. I try to deal with whoever is running whatever. I gather that the, the minister himself, the Secretary of State, is is doing his best to try and speak to the Chancellor and the Prime Minister to try and get them to move. Now, they 
I don't I don't know where that's got to, but a roadmap without any possible detail that one needs to try and get some security or or just a concrete idea is 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 just hot air. I mean, things are changing all the time, although it does seem to be going extremely slowly regarding the arts and culture. But uh, Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. What a pleasure to go through these uh, wind, wind and brass concertos. And as always, I'll be posting a Spotify playlist uh, to support the programme. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for joining us, as always. To Thank you for having me. Thank you to Fiona and Richard, and we'll be back again next week.